go live. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. We are going to wait a couple of more minutes to uh, ensure everybody has uh, joined. Thank you very much. Okay, I think it's time. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alejandro Falcón, a Charter Engineer, a CIPSA UAE Social Secretary and uh, Events Organizer. I welcome you uh, today, this afternoon, on our CIPSA webinar, Digital Strategy for Successful Prey Delivery. This is a very hot uh, subject in our uh, industry currently, as we move from traditional uh, delivery strategies to a full 3D beam model uh, environment. For those who don't know, SIPSA's uh, role in the region is to promote the intellectual welfare of its members and the improved understanding of uh, building services engineering within our society by organizing events and other activities related to the built environment. Today's agenda will be a speaker introduction, a speaker's agenda, session notes, a speaker presentation, Q&A session, brief of uh, upcoming SIPSA events and close out. The speaker of the day is Craig Garrett. He's a Bean and Digital Delivery Manager and a Strategic Advisor. Based in Dubai, Craig has over 30 years of uh, cross-industry experience with the last 10 years in the KSA and the UAE. He's recognized as a leading authority on digital delivery in the Middle East. As a regular speaker at construction conference and events, he regularly promotes industry best practice and project team collaboration practices. Building on the extensive knowledge of uh, large-scale projects, Craig is a skill in the creation and development of uh, data management throughout the supply chain. He has worked as part of the client rep representative team during construction and has a practical understanding of on-site digital delivery to facilitate digital construction, supply chain manufacturing, facilities management, operational requirements. Uh, Craig regularly facilitates industry discussion and actively supports and promotes being adoption at every level. In addition, he develops and disseminates high quality beam policy as mandated by the government and advises key clients on digital strategy throughout the whole project lifecycle. Uh, Craig will walk us through today uh, the following topics. Digital uh, culture is vital. Sound digital strategic planning, collaboration, communication and cooperation. Standards, procedures and workflows. Education and knowledge shared full life cycle thinking regardless of your role in the industry, technology and innovation, and uh, two very interesting case studies, which are King Abdulaziz Center uh, for World, World Culture at Dharan uh, KSA and the Museum of Future, Dubai. Uh, if you have questions, please feel free to write them down in the Q&A panel. And I will make sure these questions are uh, asked later on to the speaker, so we'll be more than happy to respond to them. Your camera will be off and your mic will be mute. Okay, so without further delay, I give way to the speaker of the day, Mr. Craig Garrett. Craig, the call is all yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, yep, I can replace that. Okay, hopefully you can uh, see my screen now. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you Alejandro for that for that introduction and to 
uh, Sibsy in the UAE for allowing me to speak uh, this evening. Um, and I don't think there's any point in, in introducing myself again, other than to say that I've been very uh, fortunate um, that over the last 30 years, I've delivered what I consider to be some of probably the most challenging, unique and iconic projects, both in the UK and for the last 10 years here in the Middle East. And you might even recognise some of these uh, images here on, on the right hand side as projects. Uh, in the Middle East, maybe even the, some of them that you've you've worked on uh, yourself. And I'm going to select two of those projects to speak in a bit more detail about um, as we go through uh, today's uh, presentation. Um, what I'm going to do is I will I'll take the two case studies and I'll sort of in, um, place them in between some of the other information. Uh, and hopefully that way we get we get a little bit of both. We get some of the theory and, and some of the, the, the project case studies as well as we go. So really, really, I wanted to start with a, with a question for you to think about actually, and that is, um, do you, it does your organisation have a digital culture? Um, it's it's not necessarily a difficult question, but it's certainly one that you should be asking yourselves. Um, and by that, um, I'm not I'm not asking, does your organisation use the latest innovative technology? And I'm also not asking, do you use the latest software products? What I want you to think about is this idea of digital culture and, and, and what that actually means for your particular organisation. So, so first and foremost, um, the culture part really is people. You, you are your organisation. Your organisation consists of you, the people, and it's the people who work together for the success of that business. So, so that's the culture of your organization is your people. Whatever your your people are doing is is, is your organizational culture. And the second part, of course, um, digital. And really um, what I mean by that is data. And, and we're going to talk a lot more about data as we go through this, this presentation. And data is, is becoming vitally important. So when you combine the two, what, what we're really saying here is that often the success of an organisation is determined these days by how good their people are at managing data. And that's that's where this digital culture actually comes from. How good is your organisation at managing this digital data that, um, that, that we see around us that comes from all sorts of uh, sources? So again, just to ask yourself that question, does your organisation have a digital culture? And you, you probably have answered that question already, already in your head. Interestingly, 70% of all organisational change efforts fail. Now, this was this was reported by McKinsey and Company. It's, it's you know, something I've I've come up with. 70% of all organisations, a huge number, fail to succeed at some form of digital change within their business. Now, this is a big number and, and think of all the time, effort, money and resources that have been spent in those efforts only to fail. So it really it really begs the question. So, you know, what what do we need to do to succeed? Well, interestingly, that's that's, you know, been reviewed and, 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 and studied and there are some key success factors that um, really a successful digital or cultural change um, is based on. And this is these these five um, five topics in front of us. So so firstly, really a strong motive, which is that, you know, you really have to be you have a determination and a common belief right through your whole organization and a sense of urgency. But more importantly, you need to have that key you know, um, executive level sponsor 
who's behind what it is that you're trying to achieve. If you really don't have that senior executive support for what it is you're trying to, to achieve, then it's going to be much more difficult. And of course, a team effort. This, this isn't just something that is done by one or two individuals. It really has to involve everyone. You know, that influence, credibility, the connections and responsibilities. Everyone needs to feel responsible for, in some part, maybe a lesser part for, for some functions, some job roles, but everyone needs to be involved and feel responsible for the success of what it is you're trying to achieve. And a big one that I'm going to go on to talk about in a, a bit more detail, this communication idea, and that's about making sure that whatever it is that you're planning is communicated to everyone within the organisation. And not only that, everyone's given updates and everyone's also able to celebrate maybe small successes as you go along that path. You don't have to wait till you've, you've achieved the ultimate goal. And an important one is lessons learned. We all have amazing lessons learned that we need to collect as we as we work in our businesses day to day so that we can use those lessons learned to educate others. Now under enablement, you'll see that I've circled uh, technology and of course that's an important part and technology is quite often the one thing that people um, think of when they when we're talking about this sort of digital or or cultural change. But the reality is that technology is only an enabler. It's only a tool there to, to help us achieve what it is that we're trying to achieve as our as our business goal. But it but it is there and it's an important part. But you can see that it's only one small part of many other things that we that we need to consider. So technology and process, and then we need to train our people and maybe even incentivize them if, if necessary. And then once we have that momentum of the change, we need to make sure that we support it. We avoid the skeptics and that we advance, you, you know, the change going, going forward. So while we started with that very big 70% fail, the reality is if you put these kind of strategic uh, topics in place, then success is much more likely. Now, I want to just pick up on this um, coordination. Now, I, I call these the three C's, um, coordination, cooperation and collaboration. And I, I feel quite quite passionate about this. And, and I think these words are easy to say. I think we use them a lot, but I think it's quite often quite hard to write down what they mean. And it's even more difficult sometimes to actually make it happen in, in real life. But what what really are these three words doing? Well, when we talk about co coordination, what hopefully we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid gaps or overlaps between each other's work. We're all we've all got our own tasks that we're doing. We've all got our own roles that we're performing, but we need to make sure that there's nothing falling through the gaps, or indeed that there's there's you know, people doing more than they need to because there's there's overlap. So that's the, the coordination part. Cooperation is about sharing. It's about making sure that we benefit from sharing each other's knowledge and information. And then collaboration is, is making sure that we achieve something bigger than we could have done if we were just trying to do something by ourselves. So collaboration, vitally important uh, as well. But all three of these aspects are very interlinked, really. And, and I wonder when I talk about these, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more in one of the case studies, could it be as simple as a successful project is one that has these three Cs? Could it be as simple as a successful project is one where we actually just talk to each other? Because to be honest, I think this is a this is a skill that we're losing and we need to be doing more of. Another thing that's happening at the same time is that we're going through a tremendous digital evolution. Now, initially, um, if we look at the the, the the company names at the bottom here, you'll see that obviously these are, are um, 
organisations that have either disappeared or that haven't been able to change and keep up with the market. And in terms of the storage solutions, and, and I've said here, change or die, you know, when was the last time you saw a floppy disk or a, or a cassette? Uh, or even a, even a CD or a DVD for, the, for that matter. I think we all still maybe have USB drives, but the reality is that we now push all our information, uh, uploads and downloads to the cloud. There's very little you know, media that we actually use to, to um, hand over our information or transfer our information. So there's been a, you know, there's a real evolution that has happened through that. And the same thing has happened in our industry over the last 30 years. Computing, for example, of course, has went from things being on the desktop to, to, to being in our servers. And now, as, as I mentioned there, everything now very much in the cloud and accessible from the cloud. From an engineering point of view, we used to be solely focused on drawings. Then along came models, and now we're actually talking about the key thing is the data that's in those models. Um, the data itself, we used to be talking about CAD files, then we're talking about BIM models, and now we're even talking about what the next iteration will be for that, and that could be digital twins. Whether you're familiar with that term or not, we could do a whole a whole session on, <laughs> on digital twins alone, but enough to know that, that you know, that's where we see our industry going. But many organisations are still struggling to understand BIM and what that really means for them, never mind what the what the next evolution uh, of a digital twin might be. But in the same time, um, our hardware has been getting smaller and we now have much more incredible power at our fingertips in our phones and our mobile devices. So that kind of set the scene a little bit and I'd, I'd really just like to introduce one of the, the first projects um, that I wanted to talk about today. And you may or you may not be familiar with this project. Um, this is the King Abdulaziz Centre for World Culture, a very uh, multi-use um, development uh, in, uh, in Dahran in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. And this project was uh, a design competition that was won by a Norwegian architect called Snoheta. And the, the main picture that you see is the architect's um, visualization of the project, um, you know, before it was created. And the photo that you see in the inset is a photo that I took myself um, just probably last year. Um, and, and hopefully you can see the similarity between between the two the two images. So the design of this project started back in 2007. And so you have to appreciate that many of the technologies that were of, that we take for granted now um, were either very new or were even unavailable back then. So we've really seen through this whole this whole project that you know, and especially the the 3D modeling of the civil and structural aspects, were very much in advance of the MEP disciplines at that stage. Um, however, the the uh, following the design, I personally followed this project to site in 2011, and then when I left in 2015, it was nearing completion. So roughly that project took. 10 years, but I was involved from the start right to the finish. And I think there's very few people can really say that they managed to follow a project uh, like that through design and, and, and construction. This is a main section through the through the project. And I mean, as I said, it's a very large uh, project with multiple buildings. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the shape of, of pebbles. And you can see here the main parts listed of this project, a 950-seat uh, uh, auditorium, a 200-seat theatre, 200,000 book uh, public library, great hall, museums, discovery zones, le learning and education spaces. 
all very much connected. And that yellow line that you see uh, drawn, of, drawn across is actually ground level. And that's to give you the sense of how much of this project was actually below ground and really only the five key buildings, the five main buildings that were the pebbles were, were above ground. And this was one of the first projects that I was involved in where the, the services were really interwoven through the structure and managing that cladding zone, which, which could be anything up to maybe two metres uh, wide, became vitally important. And, and detailed discussion between all the disciplines was, was necessary in order to coordinate that, that space. Just to give you again a little bit of a sense, these are all photographs that I've taken myself as I've visited the, the uh, project over, over the last few years. Um, initially, uh, while I was working there and, and, and since as, as going in as a, as a visitor, um, a, a massive library auditorium uh, and an atrium that goes goes right up through the centre with a with an escalator right through to the second floor. The great hall has this amazing copper plate finish, and all the the services are are, are hidden behind that. The main plaza, an absolutely you know gigantic space, that open space that links through all the all the five buildings. And then in the bottom right at the central light well, which carries the external light uh, to flood the below ground levels uh, that, that runs down, th down through the building. Very high level of, of finish in these spaces. Um, here again, the main auditorium, the, the 200 seater uh, theatre cinema, um, another view of the main plaza and, and what they call the library underbelly and, and a, a main window, the only window actually in the library and the cafe space there. But it was just interesting when I, when I, when we, when I thought about this, um, and these are two um, panoramic views of that uh, main plaza uh, space. I was not really, as I said, I left just before really the, the, the project was complete, so I wasn't really involved in the handover between the, the design and build the capex phase and the operational phase. But what I was able to do in one of my visits was I returned and I met with one of the maintenance engineers and I got, I got one of these behind the scenes tours. And it was an it was an absolutely fantastic day to talk to him about how he viewed the building and how he saw, saw some of the design elements of the building from an operational aspect. And some of the questions that he was asking me from the knowledge that I had from the from the design and, and build phase. And it just brought home again to me that there is very little connection. And, th and this is a problem in our industry generally, I feel there was very little connection between the the, the wealth of knowledge that went into the design and build part of this project. And then the information that's required specifically by the operation and maintenance people on a day to day basis to run to run the building. To give you a sense of, of what we're talking about here, there's a few general statistics that you, that you can pick up, pick up on. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Ram Earth. That was the first time that I'd ever came across. Um, Ram Dith as, a, as an architectural finish, uh, absolutely a, a amazing. But some of the some of the services statistics you can see here, um, I think the key ones: um, cladding panels, two thousand six hundred and forty-five unique individual cladding panels. This again because of the curvature of the of the, the pebbles, um, every panel was unique because it, you know, it curved in, in, in three dimensions different from any other. You can see some of the, the 3, 31,000 unique lighting fixtures, you know, 849 sort of electrical panels, switchboards, 
24 individual main plant rooms, and I do mean main plant rooms, not uh, others. What the, the one comment I wanted to make here is that, of course, this project was too large to be done by any one office. Um, and, and as any, you know, um, organization would handle it, though, you know, it, it was broken up to be designed by different offices around the world. And while, of course, that is a is a great re resource, great way to use the resources that you have, the big challenge, of course, is that collaboration aspect in bringing it all together as as one project, uh, especially for uh, construction. My own particular role, um, very much as client's representative, was that I sat between the design and construction teams. Um, having had a very unique knowledge from the original design stage, meant that I knew the drawings and the models and the documentation very, very well. And this role became critical in all the major stakeholder meetings, as I could finally find quickly the, the, the necessary information and, and areas on the models. And it got to the point that every meeting, um, really we needed to interrogate the 3D model in some way or another, because there were simply some 3D spaces that we could just not visualize in any other way, especially as some of these curved pebble shaped buildings would interact with each other. So I became very much used as a as a resource um, to 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 find problems and and solve them. And in addition, uh, site supervision and client representation um, gave me uh, this a level of experience that I would just simply never have got within a you know a consultant's uh, office. And absolutely, I, I would suggest to, to anyone that you know that kind of exposure in terms of site supervision or client representative roles, um, you know, is is absolutely second to none. One of the other things that we, I wanted to talk about specifically was was standards. Now, very much part of any digital strategy to put a digital strategy in place is that you you need to start to talk about BIM standards. Now, unfortunately, it's it's not exactly the the topic that that most people would want to discuss. But hopefully, what I'll try and do uh, in this little part is just to explain how important it really it really is. So while we might talk about BIM standards, one of the things that actually we're talking about is that th these standards are not called BIM standards themselves, they're called information management standards. And that's because what you're doing is managing information. Now, originally these were BS and PAS 1192. Those were the UK BIM level two mandate standards back in 2016. But more recently, some of these have been updated, updated, and that's what you can see highlighted with the dotted lines. These these new standards have been introduced, and these ones are now ISO 19650, and that started a couple of years ago, 2018, and and a couple of those were just um, were just released this year. But more importantly, is that changing from that British standard designation to that ISO standard designation, that international standard, has made these standards much more internationally uh, usable. Uh, and, and all clients now need to be aware really of these standards. And the key thing that I want to, so there are there are six standards, sorry. So four have been replaced and two are, 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 are left. Um, one is uh, BS1192 part four, which is about information uh, uh, handover, and that focuses on, on Kobe. And the other PAS 1192 part six is about health and safety. And we really feel that these will be uh, upgraded to ISO 19650 standards in the very near future. So the key thing is that, well, you know, why, why is this so important? Well, to be fair, 
all a client needs to do is specify these standards in their strategic documentation. There's no need to start you know, defining workflows and processes and making things up and creating new ways of working. It's all in these standards. These standards have been designed to be comprehensive. And really a client just simply needs to specify these standards and all the operational workflows and processes that are contained within them are then specified. So as a bit of an example, just to give you a feel for what I'm, what I'm talking about, these, these three particular graphics are extracted from that information management standard. So the first one on the left talks about the relationship between the organisational management, the asset management and the information management. And you might be aware of the organisational management because that's ISO 9001 and we're familiar with that from our QEQC procedures. From an asset management perspective, it's ISO 55000 and then from an information management perspective, ISO 19650, which is the one that we just were talking about a minute ago. The middle graphic sets out the relationship between the various requirements documents that a client must create and deliver. Now it's important of course that the client understands that these documents need to be produced, but it's also important that that design team understands what the client should be giving them. So that's these are these are vital pieces of information. And the third graphic on the right hand side sets out the stages for information transfer within a common data environment. And I'll talk a little bit more um, about that um, later on. Sorry. And one final graphic that I just wanted to show you was this again extract from ISO 19650. And this particular one shows a full life cycle information management process. It shows the flow of information with that blue sort of circling arrow, how that information should flow through the project. But also what I can draw on the top of is I can highlight to you where that exchange information requirements document is. That this is this document that the client defines its requirements by, and that's it identified there on this graphic. Equally, the response to that document from the supply chain, which is the BIM execution plan, which is maybe a more familiar document that you're that you've heard of before, and a master information delivery plan. These are the responses to that client's requirements and specify exactly how the design and build teams are going to go about delivering the project. Also of interest is along the bottom of this diagram you see a number of green and red diamonds and green circles and this indicates the various information delivery points or stages that information will be handed over on the project. As you would expect between the, the, the concept and the detailed design uh, and the construction, all these different handovers are identified in this program. But also what's identified by the red diamonds is where client decisions are required. So not only are the design team supplying the information to the client, the client has a requirement to make decisions based on that information. And not only does it cover the CAPEX part of a project, it covers the OPEX part of a project as well. And of course, I, I, you know, there's a lot more require, a lot more um, explanation required, but I think I'm sure that's more than enough information for today. I'm often asked, what I consider to be the single most vital technology required on a project or by an organisation. And I have to say, in my opinion, it's a common data environment, CDE, or sometimes referred to as a single source of truth. 
Now, what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is what I would call the traditional setup. This everyone has everything approach. And very unfortunately, there are still many organisations who are operating like this at the moment. This is where every piece of information that's issued from every one of the stakeholders gets issued to everyone at the same time. And then when it's revised or new documentation, the same is repeated and repeated very much in a manual circulation. And of course, this creates multiple copies, no real collaboration, very poor communication. And really, it's difficult to understand who has what and where is the latest version of anything. Not, not an efficient way of working. And the reason that I say a common data environment is the single most important thing to put in place in a project is because all those problems are resolved when you put a common data environment in place. This is a single source of truth, a single place that documents only are stored once, but everyone is able to access it. Quite often this, of course, is cloud based. Very collaborative, ideal for communicating and cooperating and adds real value and quality to the information that's there. It allows for decisions to be made, minimises the search time um, for anyone to find the right information that they need at any point in time. And of course, is a very controlled and automated way of working. So I would very much say that a common data environment is absolutely what you should have as the found fundamental building block within your organisation to manage your project information. So another thing is you, you might be saying, well, you know, how, you know, we need to, how, you know, how do you get that education? How do we get these clients to be able to create the right information? How do we get our own people to understand what it is we need to do in this new digital delivery process that we have? And there is a real need for education and knowledge sharing in the industry. And, and that was part of one of my roles recently. And it's important that we equip teams to better manage data creation, analysis and handover in our projects. But that can be done in a number of different ways. One is that we need to train our people. We, enable, we need to enable the people that we have to use new technologies and softwares that we need to enable us to do better the jobs that we're supposed to be doing for delivery. We need to upskill our current workforce to embrace the change and adapt to new methods. And that's everybody. I'm not just, this isn't just talking about engineering teams here. Quite often, some quite often people think that this only applies to the to the engineering personnel. But upskilling uh, should happen with regards to everybody in the organisation. The support teams, the project managers, the commercial people all need to be aware of this new way of working that's very digital and data aligned. And another thing is that we need to start to be more aligned with the entire team around what the actual organisational goals and project objectives are. Too often, um, we we forget to uh, to do this, and we should make sure that everyone is clear and what the client wants and expects. And we talk about this being the why, understand the why behind why we're why we're actually doing something. Now that's our internal teams, of course. Um, there's 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 our external influences. So we need to educate our clients, we need to educate our consultants, we need to educate um, contractors and our operation and maintenance people. Our clients who we've just been talking about have these requirements documents to create, but they need to understand and identify those, those requirements. They need to define the delivery and handover that they, that they require. And they need to be open to a more, a bigger understanding of a full asset life cycle thinking. 
Now, that's fine if your client is a owner operator. They might be more aligned to that, but not all clients are. For consultants, we need to adopt digital design processes, embrace new ways of doing digital design, insist on a collaborative project environment, promote data handling and handover, and early engagement of the end user is a critical one. Contractors need to understand the importance of that quality asset data for the operation and maintenance, who is who they hand over to, and they need to focus on their client outcomes and promote efficient data handling themselves. An early engagement again with the operation and maintenance teams is key. But the operation and maintenance people themselves are actually very educated already. They're used to dealing with and running facilities in the operations phase, and they're used to the data that they have to manage. It's actually what we're missing is we need them to raise our awareness on what they actually need in terms of the in terms of a deliverable. So that again is early engagement of the end user for the contractor. Now, I briefly mentioned there talking about a full life cycle thinking. And I want just for a minute to just talk about that a little bit more because it's quite important. This is a common graphic that I'm sure many people have seen before, and it's quite often split into four quarters, representing the client and the consultant, the contractor and the operator. But the reality is that the design and build or capex phase of a project maybe takes five years, but the operate and maintain part can maybe take 50 years, say, for a building, and maybe even 100 to 150 years for a piece of infrastructure. So actually, this diagram is not really showing a true representation. It shows that client consultant contractor taking up roughly 75% as being the capex and the operator only in one quarter at 25%. But as I said, that's actually not what we've just said. Really, the reality looks a bit more like this. Owner operators really get the benefit from this kind of thinking. That client consultant contractor, that design and build or, or capex part of the project is only lasting five years, but the owner operator has to manage this facility for the next 50 years below that. The, imp the information and the data that that operator needs to manage that, that 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 building is vitally important. And if they don't get that from the capex part of the project, it's a real missed opportunity. And it's not the information being available at the end of the design phase is not going to happen by accident. It has to be put into the, str the strategy documents as a requirement at the concept stage. I'd like to touch on this second project now. And I want to look at the Museum of the Future in Dubai. I was very fortunate again that this was the first project that I worked on when I came to Dubai. And again, in the big picture, you can see the, the architectural representation by Killer Design, the architect uh, here in Dubai. And in the small insert picture, you can see a photograph again that I took literally just a few weeks ago of the actual constructed museum of the future. And again, hopefully you can see the similarity between the two. This photograph was taken just as the final cladding panels had been uh, installed. This was a very knowledgeable and proactive client with a very ambitious high level of digital implementation, far higher than we'd ever seen before in this region. A mature level of understanding was expected from all stakeholders and the developer Miras, who was the original client, 
um, has now uh, and 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 that client has now moved on to be Dubai Futures Foundation. That BIM and digital strategy that was that was laid out, that was put in place from the concept stage, focused on some items that you might not necessarily expect. It was developed for mutual benefit. Everyone's input was welcomed. Everyone was asked to um, collaborate and communicate effectively on the documentation and the strategy that was put in place. Options were explored together. There was technology solutions were discussed and explored together as a team so that we could mutually understand the benefits that we were going to achieve from these. It really was a shared experience and we benefited from the varied backgrounds and knowledge of all the contractors and designers who were involved. There really was a common sense approach and a, and a view to keep it simple to understand, not just in terms of the documentation that we were producing, but the way that people were working. We were keen that everyone understood what it was that we were trying to achieve and it all made common sense. We had regular meetings, weekly face to face meetings, which were helped from the fact, of course, that a number of many of us were located in Dubai. Now, don't and, and, and the UK level two standards um, were mandated as on top of the, the Dubai mandate itself. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand that not all projects are fortunate enough to have this kind of approach and this kind of open minded client. And often contractual barriers and the refusal to share get in the way of doing what's right for the project. And often clients make decisions on their own without asking their supply chain for their experience. So don't get me wrong, I understand that this is an exceptional case. But what I'm trying to explain here is that with this kind of approach, this kind of open, collaborative, uh, communicative approach, everyone really felt engaged and part of what we were trying to achieve. A very collaborative, fully 3D modelled and visualised uh, design uh, was used for the design reviews and the progress meetings. Weekly live updates created for, you know, uh, open discussion forum and everyone uh, that everyone could access and cloud based collaboration platforms used with weekly work in progress updates for everyone's review. Now that's not a normal way approach. Traditional projects have staged delivery and handover at key dates, maybe even months apart. To actually have a live cloud based collaboration platform with work in progress information was quite unique and quite a challenge. But the client was actively involved at every stage of this project and specialist subcontractors were heavily involved in the details, especially as you can imagine from the structural and facade disciplines because of the complex geometry. The client wanted the design and construction of the building to be futuristic, just as the name Museum of the Future and all stakeholders were pushed to the boundaries. This is not a typical museum. This is more a technology incubator for innovative projects and technologies. But nonetheless, it had iconic architecture and of course a unique facade never seen before anywhere and very high expectations for sustainability goals, including using a nearby solar um, field um, for electricity generation. That digital strategy documentation was created from the start by the client, incorporated the industry standards, was then progressed into the consultant's delivery document and then passed on to the contractor 
once the construction began. <coughs> this document actually moved through the process. But more importantly, as well as the documents being adopted at each stage, was that the models were again. Now again, this is something that's not normally done. But again, was specified by the client. Once you've created documentation like this, <clears throat> the key thing is that you enforce it or you've just wasted your time. I could quote many projects that have had amazing digital strategies at the outset, but they've just never followed through. And in the end, they let key elements slide. But this was not the case in this particular project. You possibly saw me talk about the EIR document before and the employers, ex uh, the exchange information requirements document simply is the, the statement of what the client wants in information management terms, what they want, why do they want it, what format do they want it in, what are they going to do with it and when do they want it. It should be easy enough, yeah? But what happens when these questions aren't answered? What happens when the client is not knowledgeable and doesn't know what he wants? That's when the problems start. On the Museum of the Future, we were very fortunate that that wasn't the case, but I've worked on many projects where the, what we've been handed is a single A4 sheet of paper with those requirements. It's in your best interest to be able to ask questions and get the information and the answers to these questions that you need. But another way of looking at is what the document doesn't say, or maybe, maybe it should say, that sense of behavior, that collaborative approach, the willingness to discuss options with, with everyone involved, creating real relationships between the people in a social style, um, and, and making it really a shared experience by everyone involved. In my opinion, this is what made this project a success, was not the stuff that was written in the document, but the way in which the, the nature of the, the, the delivery was handled. In one final view on this particular project, I was fortunate to have been involved in selecting some of the supply chain organizations. It's important that we understand that the maturity of the supply chain is vitally important. Sometimes we forget as lead consultants or lead contractors that not everyone has the same capability that we do. And we have to bear in mind that on a project as these other sub consultants come on board, if they don't have the same maturity or capability that, that say the lead uh, consultant does, then that shortfall needs to be taken up by them. So it's vitally important that you put in place some of these particular um, uh, ideas listed in order to make sure that you you really do get the best um, mature supply chain organizations involved. And really now I'm, I'm, I'm winding up. I just want to start by by talking a little bit more. So the first thing really is that why, why are we, why do we do a lot of this? Well, unfortunately, our industry has a terrible reputation you know, high costs and unreliable costs, late delivery on projects, very confrontational and litigious uh, environment, poor safety record, all the things that you see here just give our industry such a bad reputation. And BIM and digital delivery is trying to address some of these items and improve the situation. Now, you might have seen this cartoon before. I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure you have. The guy on the left hand side is offering a wonderful solution, but the two guys on the right are so busy doing what they've always done that they just have no time to review what might be an amazing uh, solution. And unfortunately, that's reflection of 
sometimes what our industry appears to be like. So it's critical that when we say, well, why technology? We understand why it is that we're putting some of this technology in place. We need to enable better digital outcomes. We need to improve the way we work to provide better outcomes for our clients. We need to make sure that we deliver what it is that our clients need. We can realise efficiencies to save time and money. And that's, of course, that, ret that ROI, return on investment. Yes, technology costs. Yes, training our people costs money. But if you can achieve the efficiencies that save you time and money in the process, then that should cover that ROI. And then we automate the workflow and process delivery in order to again see those efficiencies and take away some of the mundane tasks and speed up the process. Now, here's a list of many of the innovative and technologies that you might be looking at at the moment, you might be adopting, you might have heard about or not. Parametric modeling, computational engineering, visual scripting, very much part and parcel of the new wave of, of innovative thinking that is helping us become much more efficient and remove some of the more mundane tasks from the engineering design process. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, design optimization are, are innovations that, for example, on projects like the Museum of the Future were absolutely critical because the project could not have been delivered by any other means. Reality capture, laser scanning, and both of these things possibly in connection with drones as used to be at one point a new innovative technology. Now I think these are more part and parcel of every project that I, ha that I see in some way or another. Laser setting out to me was again re was introduced in the Museum of the Future and was perfect for taking the design model onto the construction site and allowing the setting out of services to far more accurate uh, dimensions than would ever possible previously. And 3D concrete printing and modular construction have been looked at far more than ever before, especially because of some of our COVID restrictions in terms of um, on-site working and safer working in off-site uh, locations. So lots of these technologies and innovations are being looked at in specific uh, terms and every one of these could be a subject for future sessions on their own. Thomas H Davenport, the co-founder of the Institute of Analytics said this, every company has big data in its future and every company will eventually be in the big data business. Whether you believe it or not, we are all moving to have data at the heart of everything that we do. This particular knowledge triangle, which you, you may have seen before, just indicates this, this data aspect of, of what we are what we're doing. We are collecting data from, from multiple sources, but the data in its purest and simplest form is, is really of not much use to us. But only by collecting and then organising and summarising that data do we then turn that into information, structured information that we can then use. And then by analysing and synthesising, we turn that into knowledge. And here is where the key uh, real important point is. That knowledge allows us to make better decisions, and that's where the true value of data lies. It's not about the data that we are collecting. It's about what we can do with that data when we analyse it and organise it properly, and it allows us to make those better decisions. I'm nearly finished, but I just want to um, really um, take one second just to plug this organisation, CHAIN. I was very fortunate to be involved with CHAIN, which was launched in Dubai in 2018. 
And Jane, as you can see, the description is an interinstitutional initiative designed to showcase the world of engineering. But it's specifically, it's really to engage, inform and inspire young engineers. When we launched in 2018, the event was very well received and very well attended. And you'll see inside the, the red circle on the on the, the photograph that Sibsi was, was well represented at that event. And your ex-Yen Sibsi president, Munis Hamid, uh, presented actually at that event. Unfortunately, our second event w was cancelled due to the, the COVID, the implications of COVID lockdown. And hopefully we are going to be moving to a more virtual presence uh, in the very near future. But I would definitely recommend Chain as for, for all young engineers. The key message here really is that all institutions and disciplines need to collaborate and share their experience for the benefit of everyone. And my final slide is just to say, to give you some takeaways, and that is to say that digital strategy is the planning is key. Make sure you do this upfront at the concept stage of any project. Understand what you're being asked to hand over in a digital sense. And then my three C's, coordinate, communicate, collaborate. If your client isn't proactive, do it yourself. You really need to make sure you understand what it is your client wants and needs. And make sure that everyone's input is valued and that you involve everyone. Understand your client outcomes, understand each other's differences and benefit from each other's strengths. We all have a wealth of experience that we need to share with each other. Start to have a more full life cycle thinking, even if it's not really applicable to you in your role, you'll definitely benefit from having that. And of course, trustworthy data is everything. I know this has been a bit of a whistle stop tour through some of these terms and terminologies, but thank you very much for, for listening. And if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to take them now. Thank you uh, very much, Craig, for your uh, informative presentation. It has been uh, very deep, actually. Uh, I hope uh, you know the audience is, is very clear now that basically this is not only about drawing, it's not only about uh, uh, moving from a 2D uh, environment to a 3D environment when it comes to production of drawings and design, but it's, it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, as uh, Craig was explaining in the different slides of his presentation, it's all about data, it's all about information, it's all about dropping into the uh, one single source of truth, uh, material information, uh, information for future commissioning, maintenance, operation, all of those uh, together. He highlighted as well uh, uh, the importance of uh, coordination, team training, education, not only of uh, the design team members, but also uh, our clients, uh, also uh, contractors and the facility management companies. So they are fully aware and in the end we're all aligned on, 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 on this uh, to improve the efficiency in the way we deliver future projects. So really thank you, uh, Craig, uh, for this. And um, I have a couple of questions here for you. So I'm going to start. Uh, from uh, Mr. Chandan, he, he says, I, th I think, well, you, you cover this somehow, but you, you, you may give him a, a, a reply. Any common platform uh, could be suggested for facility management data workflow from design stage to handover stage, maybe software modeling, data collection and data integration. Craig? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, this this is this is one of my you know huge uh, bugbears at the moment. I I, I think and, I, and I've actually spoken in conferences on this. I think there's a there's a real gap um, that exists between the design and build and the operate and maintain, and that information that's handed over from one stage to the next is is critical. 
and we don't do it well. We we really, as an industry, don't do it well. But I think there's a realization starting now because of the the BIM and the digital handover. We are starting to say, right, you know, what what information needs to be handed over, and how do we do it, and how do you get that information, and what what do you need to put into your strategy documents at, at the beginning of a project to make sure you get the right information out. And I do think that some of our FM um, companies have a part to play in this. And I've, I've spoke to a number of them and I've said, you know, really, really, we need you to help our industry. We need you as the people who know what you need to, to tell us more, um, you know, what we need to be supplying. Um, but there's lots of, I mean, there's lots of softwares that handle it. I mean, Kobe, I, I touched on the part of the ISO 19650 standard that, that's still a BS, um, which talks about information handover uh, and Kobe. And Kobe is an interesting one because Kobe was created as, as an industry standard for that very reason to hand over that information. Um, but again, um, what we're what we're hearing is that it's still it, it, it is the industry standard solution for doing that, uh, and it's built into lots of different softwares and and you know there's there's even courses on it. Um, but even what we're hearing is that some of the FM companies are saying that it's still not ideal. So there, I think we've got a lot we've got a long way still to go. I don't think we're we're really um good at it yet but there but there are solutions and there are things that we can build into the process to make sure that we we get the best information to hand over that we need but without a doubt we need the fm companies to 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 help us understand what it is that they need for sure uh, as for specific Software solutions. Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't want to mention any any here, but certainly, you know, if you want to contact me separately, I can put you in touch with with people who would happily, you know, talk to you a bit more about that. Thank you, Craig. There is another question uh, again from Chandan. Uh, any idea uh, for US standard to be followed for facility management workflow? Yeah, well, that, again, that's a that's a really good idea. We, we, I was talking to someone recently about the US the US standards, and um, we um, I, I would say my my knowledge of the US standards is obviously not not as good, but the question that was being asked is, you know, why why does the ISO standard seem to be taking over so much? You know, um, but obviously not in the US, <laughs> uh, for mm. example. Um, but I think I think um, uh, yes, if you're if you're I mean certainly if you're in the US market, then absolutely you would have the US standard to follow for sure. I think what seems to be happening is literally the rest of the world, for whatever reason, is now aligning with the ISO standard. So although there are some other you know there's some other standards. Uh, available in some other countries. Um, I remember a colleague of mine did a did a, a university thesis on comparing all the standards across all the countries, and what he what he discovered was that no one country had like the perfect solution. The perfect solution was a bit from one, a bit from two, and a bit from three. Um, really, yes, there's the US standard absolutely for the for even for the FM workflow. Um, I'm not 100% knowledgeable in what that is, but if you're in the US, yeah, absolutely, you're following that. Literally, the rest of the world is using ISO 19650. And then when you when you the other one is when you go into the FM side of uh, projects, you're starting to talk about asset management. And when you're starting to talk about asset management, really the standard you need to be talking about is ISO 55000. And that's a whole other you know standard again um that you should be using for asset management purposes thank you guys uh, th uh, thank you for that next question is from uh, mr stuart huggins he said uh, i couldn't agree more with your points in regards to operations as a facility management consultant i constantly have to raise awareness 
on the uh, sig significance of OPEX compared to CAPEX in regards to life cycle cost. Uh, what needs to change is uh, the focus to life cycle and operation rather than short term cost saving or unnecessary over complexity. Uh, yeah. Um, like how to do that through procurement models? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, just as I said before, people understanding what it is they need and then being very clear and specifying that that's what they want. One of the project, one of the problems that we have is if no one says what, if no one, if no FM requirement is in a project at all, and I've had this, then what what do you do? Do you do nothing? Or do you use the 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 you know the fallback, which is which is Kobe? Um, most projects will just use Kobe, and that way they're they're doing something, um, even although nothing's been been specified. But the best for sure is to to clearly define what you want and put it in, uh, you know, in your in your requirements from the very from the very beginning. But but I would absolutely agree that. To over specify as well is just is is adding cost. So if you if you really want to be saving costs, then you need to, you know, just remove unnecessary, you know, over over complication. Um, another one that I did on on um, that we did uh, actually on Museum of the Future was that because again, there was no FM requirement was that we we created our, as as the contractor, we created what what we were going to deliver. We then issued it to the client and said, "Are you happy with this?" Um, and and they said yes. So we we create we created a requirement ourselves, which the client was was happy with, and that was much better than having nothing. Uh, but this is this is definitely a problem, and it, and it sounds like uh, Stuart has the same. Uh, the same issues with raising awareness of of this issue. What I would say is, if you have a client who's an operate who's a owner operator, so for example, here like again in the Middle East, someone like say the RTA uh, are in are in, in the perfect situation because they are they are operating the facilities that they've designed and and constructed. Um, so they they absolutely. Uh, understand what it is that they need for their FM requirement and they build it into their projects. So owner operators definitely have the most to to gain from this. The unfortunate reality is that there's a lot of design and development done in the region where the the contractor, the design and build contractor has no requirement after that. There's no involvement after that. So he, he really he really doesn't care what what comes next, um, and and that's not great for the industry either, unfortunately. It is not definitely great. Right. So there's another question here um, uh, from Connor. Uh, how do you see a generative design developing in the short to medium term? Yeah. Uh, obviously, this is this is huge at the moment, ab absolutely. And um, the you know the the, the possibilities um, by using this are are are, are incredible. Um, and and the implications are are so wide ranging as well. This this is this is the requirement. But what what I would say is that there's a lot of generative design development being done by the you know the 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 tier one um, consultants and contractors because they have the you know they have the large projects they have the maybe the, the people with the right capabilities um, they can they can, they're obviously looking at you know developing um, solutions you know for not just for one project but for for the future for many projects so you definitely see uh, real spikes in um, you know this kind of innovation being done within key uh, consultants and contractors, and th and that's happening right now. You know, um, where where this is going to go? I mean, I've seen I've seen some examples and talked to a lot of people um, that you know we we could get to a stage I think very very quickly where. <coughs> 
very large chunks of our design process are being handled by generative, um, you know, production processes. Um, and, you know, uh, it might be that even some complete buildings could be automatically generated once you have defined the, you know, the key parameters. So it's, I would say it's, 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 it's huge already and it's only going to uh, increase going forward. Thank you, Craig. Um, OK, it looks like uh, there are no more questions. Uh, for those who uh, prefer to ask questions later or simply now they don't have any question and something arises later on, uh, please uh, take note of the details uh, in the screen. OK, you can see Craig email and his phone number and you can actually uh, ask uh, any question to him later. Uh, there is another point here. Let me just make sure. Thank you for the response. I hope. OK, right. This is not actually a question. So. Um, as I was saying, the uh, Craig Garrett details are in the screen. Uh, any question you can address it directly uh, to them. Um, on another note, uh, you will receive your CPD certificate. OK, for those who uh, uh, appear as anonymous, make sure you have actually written your full name in the text box so that we can actually issue the CPD certificate to you. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sharing my thank you. screen again. I'm sure if you can see. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for uh, giving us this informative presentation. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, all of these details. And I hope really uh, the people who attended this uh, webinar uh, have a better understanding now uh, and more awareness on uh, what actually we are moving uh, forward. Uh, uh, this is something that there is no way back. We are moving to uh, digital delivery uh, design transformation. And this is a must. So it's important for everybody to actually gain awareness and uh, become fluent and knowledgeable on this. It's a question of time. So uh, I believe this is a very important topic that everybody needs to take into account. Uh, follow us uh, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, in the accounts that can be seen in the screen. You can also find us on uh, cipse.org and you can reach us uh, anytime at uae at cipse.org. Thank you again uh, very much, Craig, uh, Gary, for your presentation. Thank you to the audience. I hope you have enjoyed and uh, have a very good evening. Thank you.